Hello, I am Taizi here, National Director of Lung Cancer Education. Now I'll be moderating today's session. Welcome to the Lung Cancer Patient Meetup on the Go webinar on the pros and cons of minimally invasive lung cancer surgery and who is eligible. We would like to acknowledge our sponsor, the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, for supporting lung cancer programs like our session today. Our featured speaker will be Dr. Peter Bake. He is a thoracic surgeon at the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, otherwise known as CTCA. He will present on what you need to know about potential side effects and what to expect with minimally invasive surgery to help you or a loved one be more prepared and know what to ask your doctor. Born in South Korea, Dr. Bake immigrated to the US with his family when he was 12. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Zoology at the University of Texas in Austin. He completed his Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine at Kirksville College Osteopathic Medicine in Missouri in 2005, earning several academic awards. After interning for a year at the Brown Family Residency Program in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, he was a resident in general surgery at St. Barnabas Hospital in Bronx, New York and then at Arrowhead Regional Medical Center in Colton, California, where he served as chief resident in general surgery from 2010 to 2011. In 2011, he became a resident in cardiothoracic surgery at University of Miami, uh, Miller School of Medicine in Jackson Memorial Hospital of Miami, Florida. From 2013 to 2014, he completed a fellowship in minimally invasive esophageal and thoracic surgery at Swedish Medical Center in Seattle. He joined CTCA in July 2014. Dr. Bake is board certified in general surgery and thoracic surgery by American uh, Osteopathic Board of Surgery. He's a member of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, the American Osteopathic Association, and the American College of Osteopathic Surgeons. In 2017, he was named to the Quality Oncology Practice Initiatives Task Force of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. He was also elected as a Secretary Treasurer of the Cardiothoracic Division of the American College of Osteopathic Surgeons. Dr. Bake also serves as an adjunct clinical assistant professor in surgery at Arkansas College of Osteopathic Medicine and as an adjunct clinical assistant professor at Oklahoma State University College of Osteopathic Medicine. At CTCA, Dr. Bake specializes in minimally invasive thoracic procedures, including laparoscopic, video-assisted thoracic surgery, and, and robotic surgery. As we begin, please note that participants will be on mute. Participants will be able to ask questions in the chat feature of the webinar platform. We will have a brief question and answer session after Dr. Bake's presentation. Without further ado, it is our honor and privilege to have Dr. Bake speak. Dr. Bake, the floor is yours. Thank you. And the honor is actually all mine, and especially on this uh, you know, Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, thanks to American Lung Association and you know, CTCA and Lung Force to uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, kind of share my inf information on minimally invasive lung cancer surgery. So let's see. So disclosure-wise, um, I'm with the um, AstraZeneca for uh, as a uh, member of the Speaker Bureau. So agenda, uh, we're going to go over the brief um, historical review, um, kind of discuss what is minimally invasive surgery then discuss the methods and diagnosis, uh, methods of diagnosis and staging, indications for lung cancer surgery, indications for minimally invasive surgery, potential complications and post-surgical um, expectations. So it's always good to uh, learn about history um, briefly. And it's actually interesting because um, the, the, uh, a book written by uh, Roger of Cernerno, um, um, in 1180, uh, or uh, uh, written by one of his uh, pupils um, of him, uh, in Practica Cirurgiae, you could see the the wounds that are sustained during war and how they were treating him. It's interesting to see that they're always um, kind of acting like they're kind of surprised that they got stabbed. But um, it's always 
it's interesting how they were actually um, um, you know, learning about how to treat these wounds. And then the first documented lung surgery was in 1499 um, in Italy, uh, Roland from Parma. And they, he actually resected a, a portion of, the, um, of a uh, infected lung between two ribs. So that's always interesting. Um, and then um, brief thing about stethoscopes. Stethoscope is a tool that we, you know, all physicians um, I use, or most of the physicians, um, but it was actually invented in 1816, and it's, um, uh, it means I see the chest. And um, it's actually uh, interesting how it was just a single tube and um, you listen. Of course, the other way is to, before stethoscope, was to put your ear um, on someone's chest and listen. And then um, the lung surgery, I thought this was really interesting because the type of surgery that they did without anesthesia um, was, um, and it was written by American surgeon Milton Anthony and French surgeon Le Chevalier Richon. I don't even know if I'm correctly, uh, pronouncing it correctly, but treatment of uh, war wounds, abscesses, and lung hernias. And the, here's a huge thoracotomy that they were explaining and it just looks painful, yeah, even for me as a thoracic surgeon. So, um, you know, the history of lung surgery is uh, with the advent of anesthesia, it has really uh, taken off. But in order to do these um, surgeries, um, you have to be able to see. And one of the things that we have to always do is bronchoscopy and laryngoscopy. And the first laryngoscopy was documented in 1854. And then first anesthesia, um, of course, was for dental extraction and removal of nexus, uh, simple procedures. But for thoracoscopy or VATS was in 1910, uh, more than 100 years ago, by Professor Hans Christian Jacobius. Um, and it's uh, very interesting how they did it. Um, um, and they were actually um, forerunners of um, you know, modern uh, minimum invasive surgery. And of course, getting the uh, doing the surgeries done, getting the surgeries done um, back then was means um, you have an audience. Um, I'm sure it was uh, very intimidating for the patient. So, what is minimally invasive surgery? Um, you know, the traditionally, um, the lung surgeries were done using a thoracotomy, a lung resection for lung cancers. Um, so, thoracotomy means you make a big incision between usually fourth or fifth or fifth or sixth ribs. And uh, you divide the muscles, move the muscles out of the way um, and go in between the ribs. And uh, usually that involves cutting of the rib, uh, a portion of the rib um, and to get access and be able to have a visualization. Good thing about that is you're getting a full exposure of the chest cavity and be able to do the, perform the surgery that you're uh, planning to do. However, it's very painful. Um, it's very limiting postoperatively, and you know healing takes time. And so, um, if you're an avid golfer, I mean, you're um, you're not going to be able to play golf uh, for several weeks after this type of surgery, and your you know swing and everything else will be um, very affected by it. Of course, if you're um, um, you work. Um, in construction, for example, then trying to do any type of construction work after this type of surgery would be very limiting um, because of risk of lung herniation and wound um, complications. And because some of the muscles are cut, you're not going to have the strength um, as before. And so that's where the minimally invasive surgery comes in, minimally invasive surgery. And this is a um, diagram of VATS or thoracoscopy. And um, you have a camera and you have at least a couple of instruments. Um, so someone is usually holding the camera for us and we have at least two instruments to work. And so this allows smaller incisions and doing the surgery um, and using these tools. Um, these are some of the tools that we can use. Um, usually the uh, thoracoscopy or VATS uh, tools are straight but they have come out with um, um, articulating tools that you can actually kind of go around the corners and be able to, instead of having a straight 
tool um, to be able to do more procedures and to kind of uh, to uh, safely get around critical structures like pulmonary arteries. This is a picture of, on the left is a picture of the um, uh, the robotic uh, grasper, and it actually allows for uh, multiple um, uh, planes of articulation, and it and that's what I've been actually employing more so than bats these days uh, whenever I'm performing anatomic resections. So. This is very interesting because look at the robot when they first came out here. Um, and this was the first generation of surgeon console um, for the robot and has um, evolved into very um, uh, cumbersome and um, awkward looking robot to now becoming very smooth and very easy to use. And now they have even come out with the single port robot um, it's not really used in thoracic, but for abdominal um, procedures, this is great. And then here's the console that we use now. And when you compare it to 1996, um, you know, in 96, it looks like um, a lot of Nintendo video games kind of put together. And um, now it's 3D, uh, magnified 10 times, and it's uh, very easy to use. So again, what is new invasive surgery? Robotics. Um, this is a picture of when I was doing a, a lobectomy for a patient, and these are the small incisions. So now, instead of having two hands working, I have a camera, camera port, and I have three instruments working and an assistant. So I have more or less four um, different instruments that are being used at the same time, and it takes some coordination, but most of the instruments that I'm using are being controlled by me. And so this allows me to, instead of um, um, trying to communicate with my assistant what to do next, I'm, I'm using the instruments the way I want it. So hopefully you guys are not grossed out by pictures of um, a human body. If you are, just close your eyes and just kind of listen. Uh, important thing is that what I see, and we usually what I see is colored pictures, but we kind of um, um, grade it out so that it's not as intimidating. But you see the lung, and you see all the dissection that I can do, the type of um, and how large or magnified structures are. And so here's a nerve that I can see. Here's the vagus nerve, and Here's a recurrent coming in in this area. And everything I see are magnified. I could see everything. And so then I could have a, a better dissection. And this is the aorta or the big vessel coming off the heart. And I could see it and, you know, I don't injure it. And so then um, the, the biggest incision is where I have to take the lung out. That's why it has the big incision. Um, the principle of surgery or any oncologic surgery is that we don't go in and mash the tissue to bring it out in a small incision. Uh, we want to make sure we want to bring it out in one bag contained so it minimizes the spread. So this is a, uh, it's a very complicated slide, but it's really important to know that your doctor communicates with you and why it's important to get the staging done. So staging compo is composed of T and M. T stands for tumor. What is the tumor doing? What is the size of the tumor? How is it behaving? Is it well differentiated, moderately differentiated? Is it poorly differentiated? Is that in going through the lung tissue, trying to escape out of the lung into the chest cavity, or is that um, you know, invading the, the chest wall? Or is that invading the more proximal or blood vessels or airway? And it, um, so that's what T stands for. Lymph nodes, we have lymph nodes any, everywhere. And so, um, you know, lymph nodes, what are lymph nodes? Well, I consider lymph nodes as a um, foreign body processing station. So whenever, like for example, kids, they get a really bad, you know, cold, they get 
um, lymph nodes that are uh, that uh, swells. And then once they get better, it resolves. Well, lymph nodes are kind of like substations that gets the foreign body or infection or whatnot and processes it and then goes to uh, the major organs to even further process it. Um, lung cancer cells likes to travel and most of the time um, it likes to travel along a specific pathway. Doesn't always happen, but that's usually the case. And so then you match uh, T N to decide, uh, determine. And then on top of that, uh, M stands for metastasis. It has gone to anywhere else. And all those combinations will let us know what the staging is. And staging is very important because that's going to let us know if the patient will require surgery or chemotherapy or chemo radiation or combination of everything. And all these uh, treatment options are being developed and getting uh, the, the recommendations are um, being improved every year. And so the, the staging, there's already an eighth edition and um, soon enough, um, there's gonna be a ninth edition because they look at more data, more patient population and, um, and they see that, hey, there, there are certain things that they may find in the, within the tumor or the lymph nodes that's gonna make it where the patient's not gonna do as well. And so here's a graph of, a, um, um, and this is what, the five-year survival uh, rate is 1A1, meaning it's a small, less than one centimeter, no lymph nodes. Five-year survival, what they saw was about 90%. So it's not 100%. And this is a stage where we want to catch it. If it's in the lymph nodes, then it becomes already stage two. And if you go to stage three, which means it's involving the lymph nodes in the middle of your chest, Five-year survival is 41%. Of course, with the immunotherapy and targeted therapies and all the chemotherapies that we have right now and the treatment options, actually the, the five-year survival is improving. However, it's still scary. And that's the reason why staging is crucial, getting the right diagnosis and staging. So some of the methods for um, staging, you have the CT scan. And um, what I put up are two different CT scans. One is CT scan without contrast and with contrast. And so without contrast, you don't see the, the vessels as well. You don't really see the demarcation, what the um, structures in between are. But with the contrast, you'll be able to see more clearly what it is. PET scan, what is PET scan? PET scan is, and I tell my patients, is that it's a uh, radioactive sugar water that gets injected. So any tissue that uses up a lot of sugar will become bright. Infe infection, inflammation, cancer, or any organs that use a lot of um, sugar. And so here's the um, PET scan image of the, someone's um, um, head, and it's bright. And this is not all cancer. This is actually all brain, because brain uses a lot of sugar. Here's a um, chest. Here's the heart. You can see the heart muscle is using sugar, so it's bright. But here's the cancer. It's brighter uh, because it's using up a lot of sugar. Of course, not all cancers take up a lot of sugar. Some are like carcinoid tumors, uh, which is a, a more benign behaving um, lung cancer, may not take up sugar. Then, of course, and you look at this, oh, my gosh, she has, you know, this person has you know, two areas. Well, these are the kidneys and it gets processed in, within the kidneys and then you pee it out. And so that's why those areas, areas are going to be bright. But if you have arthritis, it may become bright. If you have any type of infection, it's going to be bright. And so if there are areas that are concerning for uh, metastasis because it's um, PET scan positive, it's important that we get tissue diagnosis. So one of the important things that I want you guys to see is the, here's a CT scan, regular CT scan, versus CT scan that's done during PET scan. So the difference is that in, during CT scan, you have your, usually have your arms up unless you're not able to, and you have to hold your breath. And then the CT, uh, the gantry uh, goes around and um, takes pictures. A PET scan, you're actually breathing throughout the whole, uh, scan. So what you notice is that the structures are much more clear, more 
there's definitely more contrast. And pet skin, it's fuzzy. So if you have small nodules, it's sometimes hard to tell on a PET scan. So CT-guided biopsy. CT-guided biopsy is when they, um, using CT scan, um, insert a needle and biopsy a lung nodule. So this is great if um, uh, lesions are peripheral. And um, of course, you're breathing. So it's a moving target that they have to go through. Possible complications that are, can happen are hematoma. Um, or bleeding because the needle is going through smaller vessels and, and, and or a pneumothorax or collapse of the lung um, because the um, needle has gone through the lung tissue and air has leaked out. And about a third of the patients who develop pneumothorax after this procedure will need a chest tube um, to reinflate the lung. MRI is very useful in certain uh, situations. So um, mostly when we are worried about the tumor invading adjacent structures. So here's a um, picture of a tumor that's invading actually into the vertebrae or the backbone of this patient and actually going into the spinal canal. And trying to resect this is not possible because I cannot go in and resect into the spinal canal. And so then you know, that will allow me to say this patient's tumor is too advanced for resection. So what are some of the tools that we use? Bronchoscopy, it's a scope that we use, um, goes down your throat, looks and biopsies. Um, here's a ultrasound. There's a tiny ultrasound that spins and shows us once we get to the lesion to tell us. Then this is a um, navigational bronchoscopy and I tell you, once you find a lesion, you could use electromagnetic uh, navigation um, to get to the lesion uh, using a um, virtual map, um, but it's still limited. And now the newest technology is the, the robotic bronchoscopy. And um, um, with the help of the uh, fluoroscopy or even C um, CT scan at bedside, um, the accuracy of being able to get those lesions and get the diagnosis increases tremendously. So we're very excited about that. So immediate synesthesia, how do we biopsy those lymph nodes that I showed you earlier, lymph nodes in the middle of the chest? One way is to do actually a bronchoscopy. It has an ultrasound on the side, and they ultrasound, look at it, and biopsy it. And this has become so good meaning the false negative rate is so low now that the procedure that I'm going to tell you next is not, is not done as much um, because this is a minimum invasive outpatient procedure and you go on the same day and the complication rate is very, very low. This is a mediastinoscopy uh, and what it is is I make a small incision and I go below all these vessels, uh, these vessels, along the airway and I get lymph nodes and I biopsy and then it's actually magnified as, as well. So I get a good biopsy of it, but within the bronchial ultrasound, it's not being used as much. Lung function test. Lung function test is where you go into this chamber and um, you have a um, little uh, device and you have to, for about 30 minutes, um, you have to breathe in, breathe out, and then say, uh, it's quite taxing exercise, but it's really important to tell us if you are able to tolerate surgery, you know, uh, you, what if um, after surgery, your lung function is where there's going to be increased uh, complication rate, or if you have an increased chance for um, needing oxygen, then the recommendation may change, you know, from surgery to maybe radiation. And so that's really important. So cardiac risk stratification, meaning getting cardiac clearance. It's actually risk stratifications because you know we're seeing how what your at risk is, and um, you know you do EKGs, echocardiogram, and cardiac stress test. Why is that important when you're doing lung surgeries? Well, I'm not a plumber, so um, but I kind of understand plumbing because I had to change um, uh, kitchen sinks um, a couple of times and bathroom stuff, and um, what. You know, simplistically, what the lung is doing is that 
it's exchanging carbon dioxide and oxygen. So your all your blood volume from your right heart goes into your lungs. And you just imagine pipes getting smaller and smaller. And then the oxygen and carbon dioxide exchanges. But what happens when you have multiple pipes and some of the pipes disappear? So the diameter of the pipe, total diameter, decreases. And um, when it decreases, the velocity or the flow through the pipe will increase, but the pressure decreases. What that means is, in order to maintain the pressure, because your body has all these barrel receptors, to be able to um, see what the pressure is, and your right heart has to pump harder in order to maintain the pressure. And when you do that, the heart has to work harder. And if it does, and if you have cardiac issues, then you may uh, end up with a right heart failure or heart attack and things like that. And that's really uh, something that we want to avoid after lung surgery or any surgeries, but especially lung surgeries. Smoking cessation. Obviously, the best thing is to quit smoking as now would be ideal, but uh, we know that how we understand how difficult it is to quit. But with smoking, when you quit within an hour, what nicotine does is it constricts or it makes the vessels narrower. But once uh, nicotine goes in within an hour, the vessels are able to relax. And when you I, within the lung, you have these little tiny hairs that actually move foreign body out so that you could cough it out. But with nicotine and tar and um, all the smoking, all the chemicals, it actually paralyzes those hairs. And within about a month, it, the function becomes normally uh, normal. And so that's why you have the smoker's cough, trying to get all the um, junk out more. Um, but it's not able to do it because things are not moving. Um, and so most surgeries, it's important to um, quit as soon as possible. But for lung surgery, interestingly, if um, you need to quit about four weeks, about three to four weeks after, uh, before surgery. If you quit and you have lung surgery within three, four weeks of quitting, you're actually complication increases. And that's un you know understandable because your ciliary function or the hair functions are coming back slowly, but you're going to be able, your body's trying to get rid of all this. And so all the junk that's in there and all the um, foreign body. And so then when your body's trying to recover from this, now you throw in surgery and you stress the body and you're trying to remove more things and you could have increased um, um, uh, lung uh, dysfunction. So indications of a surgery. I'm not going to go over this and or expect you guys to memorize this, but these are kind of the guidelines that we like to use. And these are based on, again, multiple patients, thousands and thousands and thousands of patients. And what would be the best thing? Uh, what would be the best evidence? And so this is a, you know, we follow the stage. Um, and um, of course, not everyone meets the criteria, but we try to go because we know that this will allow the best outcome that we have in current times. So what are some of the indications for surgery? Most of the lung cancer surgery, stage, stage one or two disease, and for certain stage three A diseases. And the goal in any uh, cancer surgery is one, curative intent, two, anatomic resection, three, adequate uh, lymph node sampling, and four, to maintain quality of life. What's the point of doing a pneumonectomy if the patient is going to be on a ventilator forever. So this patient has a, a lung nodule or almost a mass. And this is actually uh, can be taken out when we know that doing all the staging, patient is able to get surgery. So we did the surgery for this patient. You may say, oh, the size is kind of big, but looking at this and all the lymph nodes being negative, um, still it's stage 1B um, patient. Here's the PET scan of the same patient, and that's what it showed, and it didn't show anywhere else. Here's a patient that had this lesion, and what you can see is that the lesion is not as big 
as the other patient. However, what you notice is that this is the aorta. That's the big vessel coming up the heart and supplying blood to your entire body. It's right next to it. And so most of the time, this is not through the entire wall of the aorta, but it's not something that I would tackle minimally invasive. This is something that I could still do, but using uh, more of an open approach, because if it bleeds from the aorta, I have to repair it, and that's not possible with the, any minimally invasive approach. Here's a patient that had small lesion in the back of the lung, and you say, okay, well, maybe that patient can get surgery. Well, this patient can't get minimally invasive because it's involved in the chest wall. And so you have to take the, um, at least two, uh, usually about two or three ribs, depends on what I see during surgery. And that's not possible with minimum invasive either. So what are the indications for minimum invasive? You know, like I mentioned before, meet the surgical principles. It has to be efficient and, um, you know, have, and be able to achieve the goal, efficacy and safety. Also be able to meet the oncologic principles that I talked about earlier adequate lymph node sampling, anatomic reception, curative intent, and quality of life post-surgery. And so minimally invasive surgery is not something that can be done on every patient, but it's something that should be offered if I can meet all the criteria. But at the end of the day, the surgery that I do, open or minimally invasive, should have equal outcome oncologically and um, outlook-wise. So what are some of the um, types of lung surgery? Um, you have an anatomic section. So what is anatomic resection? Anatomic resection means that you are actually dissecting individual airways, pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein, and getting that whole area. So here's a lung. You could see here's the upper lobe, middle lobe, and lower lobe. And within those lobes are different segments, apical segments, anterior, posterior segments, and they have specific vessels that go through. And so in order to do an anatomic dissection, here's a lobectomy. I'm getting the entire lobe out. And the reason why I have to do the, take the entire lobe, even if it's a small in, um, um, a nodule, is because for this patient was because it's so central in nature. And so I can't, if the lesions here, I am not going to violate the planes um, and risk um, cancer cells from not being taken out. Here is a segmentectomy, usually resolved for small peripheral tumors. And what you do is you get the segment that the tumor is in. So here is a tumor in the lingula. And so you isolate the vessels, airway, and then you could go across. And there's always a little bit of um, and this is called indocyanin green, and it's, uh, um, it's a chemical that fluoresces um, under UV light. And once I see where the vessel is, I could isolate it and cut the, um, um, the segment. And that actually allows for the anatomic boundaries that are being supplied by the uh, blood vessels. So sleeve lobe. What is a sleeve lobectomy? Sleeve lobectomy is when you have a tumor that's within an airway, but you want to preserve, um, you want to preserve the um, the lower lobe, for example. Here is a middle lobe lesion, but you want to preserve it. So what you do is you take a portion of the airway out and you bring it together, and you can see on the CT scan how where the lesion is. So what is a non-anatomic resection? It's a wedge resection. Um, so you go in, you find the lesion, and you um, divide it. It's mostly used for diagnostic purposes or metastatic lesions um, or benign processes where you have to kind of get the lung out, but you don't have to do an anatomic um, oncologic principles because it's benign process. And so it should not be used for lung cancer. Um, um, unless you're there to obtain diagnosis. And so what happens is they usually go in, there's a lung nodule, biopsy cannot be done. I go in, do a wedge, 
send it to pathology. Pathologist looks at it under the microscope. And then if they say there's cancer, then I do a lobectomy or segmentectomy or whatever anatomic resection that I have to do. Or patients who cannot undergo anatomic resection, but are not a candidate for alternative, like chemotherapy or radiation, then I may be able to go in and resect that area, knowing that there is going to be increased risk of um, recurrence. And a lot of the res resections um, can be done. Um, um, res resection, segmentectomies, lobectomies, all those things can be done minimum invasive as long as the tumor um, is um, amenable um, to minimally invasive surgeries. So what are some of the uh, possible complications? Um, complications could be, here's a aorta, here's a pulmonary artery. And so these things can get injured. And these vessels, when they bleed, they bleed a lot. And so open or, or thoracotomy or minimally invasive, you could injure those structures. But if you're using the robot or doing that, if there's major bleeding, it's very hard to uh, repair that area. And so then we have to convert to open. Um, you could get infection of the wounds or you could get pneumonias if you don't walk. And so it's really important that anytime you get um, surgeries, but especially lung surgery, you walk after surgery, breathe, cough, even if it hurts. We have pain medications for that. Otherwise, you could get pneumonias. And if you have pneumonias, then you're going to be in the hospital longer. There's going to be an increased uh, complication rate. And you may end up with a chest tube longer as well. And then other parts of the lung. This wasn't for lung cancer per se, but here's the superior vena cava. That's a big vessel going into the heart. Here's the asgus vein. Here's a vagus nerve. All of these things can get injured because it's in the dissection plane. If there is any scarring, then um, can get injured. So it is something that's really important to know. So one of the um, things when dealing with left-sided surgery is the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. So your cord opens and closes. But if it gets injured, it stops working. So especially on left side, because a nerve runs where this lymph node is, um, one of the lymph nodes live in this area. And if that gets injured, um, then you get a vocal cord paresis and paralysis, and you have to uh, surgically repair it. And here's a picture uh, of that area. So chylothorax, what is chylothorax? Chylothorax is, like I talked about, mentioned before, was lymph nodes and lymphatic fluids. So it's not artery, it's not a vein, but a third vessel, lymph, uh, gets uh, lymphatic vessels that get, um, um, when you're taking the lymph nodes out, we have to divide those vessels. Well, if too much of those vessels, especially these large vessels, get cut, and if it drains a lot of fluid, um, you get this kind of milky um, fluid called chylothorax. And if there's too much, we have to either surgically treat it or medically treat it. And so that's another potential complication of lung surgery. Um, for smokers, especially, or someone who's um, on chronic steroids, anytime you cut through tissue or anyone who had radiation before, anytime you cut through tissue, it may not heal as well. And if it doesn't, especially the airway, because we like to use the staple to staple and cut, but that airway can actually open up. And if it does, then you get this thing called bronchoporal fistula. And so here's the airway. And this looks like a big defect, uh, but it's not. I mean, the staples are I mean, tiny. So the defect itself is probably about a big, but that's enough to cause a lot of issues um, postoperatively. So here's the uh, CT scan. And you, what you can see is normal lung is supposed to look like this, kind of grayish black. And But for this patient, had a lot of COPD emphysema. These are all bolus disease. So anytime I go through this area uh, with a stapler, and when you go through, uh, the staples go through the lung tissue, and because the lung is collapsed, as it re-expands, it's gonna stretch. When it stretches, it's gonna leak air. When you have healthy tissue, this heals very uh, quickly. However, when you have COPD and bolus disease, it's gonna take a long time. And if that area is really weak, it may tear more. And so you may end up with a chest tube that could be more than five days 
even seven days, even two weeks. Sometimes we have to put a valve in to help heal that area. And then uh, anesthesia risks, heart attack, stroke, clot in the lungs or pulmonary embolism, clot in the legs or deep vein thrombosis, uh, vascular occlusion. So here's a CT scan of a patient. You could see the SMA or superior mesenteric artery. And you may be wondering, why are you looking at the uh, superior mesenteric artery, which is actually uh, that supplies the small intestines? Well, if you look at the CT scan, the lumen should be big, but it's very narrowed. So if you have low blood pressure, you may not get enough flow through that vessel and actually could cause clotting of that area. And if it does or gets occluded or your small intestines don't get enough blood, and if it does, your small intestines will literally necrose and die because it's not getting any blood. And so that can happen as well. And arrhythmia atrial fibrillation. I talked about right heart having to work harder. But when you um, put strain, your heart may not get ha be happy. And so then it starts to kind of quiver and you get this thing called atrial fibrillation. Anytime you do lung surgeries, you have lung surgeries, um, you get atrial fibrillation. Usually gets better within about a month, but it may be a, a become uh, chronic as well. So here's a picture of a chest tube. What is chest tube? Chest tube goes in between the lung and the chest wall and drain fluid and air. And um, these are the things that you will carry after um, lung surgery to drain the fluid and to ensure that you have a one-way valve to let the air out. And so these are different types of brands. Um, if you have a prolonged air leak or you know, um, your lung is not healing well, you may have to go home with the device to collect fluid and allow the air to escape, but not go back in. And so here's a Heimlich valve. So it's a one-way valve. It goes in, goes out. This thing opens up when the air goes through, but it collapses. And here's an, uh, two other devices that uh, can be used. And usually, if it's a little more output, we like to use the bigger ones. But if it's a smaller, uh, not too much um, output, then um, we use this device. One of the biggest things after any type of surgery, including lung surgery, is constipation. So with anesthesia, your bowels kind of goes to in this kind of sleep mode that it's paralyzed. And narcotics, we know that narcotics will cause slowing of the motility of the intestines. So then what happens is you get this hard stool that gets stuck in the rectal vault. And so trying to push that out, is very difficult. But then when you have pain in the chest and when you try to push, it's going to hurt more. So you don't want to push. So it's a vicious cycle. And so it's really important after any type of surgery, especially lung, lung surgery, that you use the stool softeners. Uh, sometimes you may need suppositories or enemas. Um, and I call this the last option, the, uh, the shotgun approach, or is the bowel prep um, when you're doing colonoscopies. We don't like to do that just because it's, um, you know, that may cause a vomiting in certain patients and we don't want to have an aspiration. So this is something that we want to avoid as much as possible. Occasionally, we may have to do a disinfection um, digitally, um, but try 95, 99% of the time, stool softeners and suppositories. That will do the job. So pain is another issue. You could see here are the ribs. And here are the nerves and the vessels. And so the chest tube goes in. And as the chest tube moves and you breathe, what happens is it compresses the nerve. And so uh, what we try to do is kind of uh, inject local anesthetic between the ribs uh, where the nerves run. And here's the different ways of doing it. This is done from outside. This is done from inside. And then we do multimodal approach using ibuprofen, uh, acetaminophen, gabapentin, um, for neuropathic pain, metacarbamol as a muscle relaxant. And we try to avoid narcotics, but um, we may have to use narcotics. And the important thing about acetaminophen and uh, ibuprofen is that you could alternate, and that has an additive effect. So, for example, here's a, um, 8 a.m., the noon, 4 p.m., because you don't want to take too much um, acetaminophen nor ibuprofen. The important thing about ibuprofen is that you have to make sure you eat food with it, um, and make sure you hydrate yourself. 
So what are some of the things that you want to avoid? Well, no driving until no longer taking narcotics um, because you'll be sleepy and um, no bath, no swimming, no scuba diving or skydiving, uh, no heavy lifting, no more than 10 pounds for, for six weeks, even if it's a minimum invasive surgeries. And don't be a couch potato. That increases the risk of pneumonia, uh, clot in the lungs. And um, as you don't move, the longer you don't move, the harder it's going to be for you to recover. Uh, what we say is if a, an elderly patient goes into ICU, in an ICU bed, one day of decondition, deconditioning will require a week of rehab. So if they're um, in bed five days, it's going to take them five days, five weeks for them to recover and get their strength back. So when can you go back to work? If you're working at a desk, as long as you're not tolerating narcotics, you could go back within a week or two. But manual work, obviously, you want the wounds to heal. Um, so we say about six weeks. And one of the other questions that I get commonly asked is, when can you fly? It depends on your heart and lung function. So imagine if you have a collapsed lung, and at 8,000 feet, that's where most um, commercial airliners are set at, except 787 or the Dreamliner, which is at 6,000, your gas, any gas expands by 25%. And so you may not, you probably have some symptoms, but imagine this increasing, that's gonna have, uh, have more effect on your body. And if you're a marathon runner, you're gonna tolerate it. But if you have, a, you have any heart issues, your heart's not gonna be happy, you could increase for heart attacks. And obviously you're not gonna be able to breathe as well. But even in normal um, um, patients, your oxygen level can decrease by about 89 to 94% instead of being 95, 100%. And so your oxygen uh, exchange already decreases. And so when can you fly? If your heart's okay and it's a minimal, minimal resection, you could, they could fly um, you know, a day or two after surgery, as long as it's safe to do so. But if you do a major resection or comorbidities, then you shouldn't fly until it's safe to do so. So it, it's very important that you talk to your um, uh, physicians. And so, um, you know, minimal invasive surgery. And um, it's important that not all um, lung cancers can be treated with minimal invasive surgeries, but most can these days. Um, but important thing is that we have to make sure that we follow the surgical and oncologic guidelines. Uh, we have to make sure that what we're doing is, is what we will do if it's an open procedure. And um, of course, the, the cons is, or, um, is that if we cannot do it minimum invasive, then we may have to open to the open procedure. Um, so you always have to be prepared for that. And I think this is the end, I think, it's for questions. Thank you, Dr. Baik. That was a very informative uh, presentation. Uh, thank you for sharing all of your wisdom and, and your experience with everyone. Um, yeah, let's begin the question and answer session now. Um, we've got a few questions that came in from the registration, um, and hopefully this will give some time for folks who are with us live um, to populate the chat with their questions as well. So the first question, um, it, which is a common theme that we, we've we gotten asked uh, quite a few times is about um, late stage lung cancer and mm -hmm. stage four um, oligometastatic lung cancer. Are there any benefits to late stage lung cancer and when would, would that be appropriate? So what we know is that when it's late stage, um, meaning stage three, B, even four, um, what you need is systemic therapy. We say that it's the worms out of the can. It's already um, has gone everywhere else. So if you end up doing surgery, what's gonna happen is that you need time for you to recover in order to get the systemic therapy. And that's gonna delay it for sure, uh, four to six weeks. And you don't wanna do that. And so there's very limited data on, um, on late stage well, there's a lot of data that late stage patients should not get surgery by systemic therapy. Oligometastatic disease, meaning there's only one or two areas, maybe three areas in the body that is shown, found, but that's on imaging. How can you know that there are any other metastatic microscopic disease anywhere else in the body? So I'm very hesitant about operating on those patients. 
Um, and the data is not there to operate on um, offer surgery on oligometastatic disease. But because there are few patients um, that you know, uh, we offer those patients, so we don't know the exact outcome of it. But because oncologically, if we, you have um, oligometastatic disease, there is probably disease in every, um, somewhere else in the body. Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Bick. Uh, that explanation um, it helps everyone understand, you know, what to expect in late stage there. Um, another question that we've gotten is, um, do I have to see an oncologist after surgery? Yes, um, I prefer to have um, almost all my patients, unless you're a stage 1A1 patient or 1A patient, even then, now there are studies coming out with immunotherapies. Um, if there's specific mutation like EGFR mutation, um, then we know that stage one, um, one B patients and above may benefit. There could be a survival benefit, meaning, and then you saw the 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 chart with the percentage on five year old mortality. So we still have room to improve, and so we're working on it. The data is just coming out, and it's actually very exciting to see it. But the important thing is that it's not the surgeons who usually order these tests, but it's the medical oncologists because they know they are the ones who give the treatments. And so it's always good to have other people looking at a multidisciplinary, two more boards, very important to discuss, even if it's early stage, um, that they be considered or at least evaluated. So seeing an oncologist as a whole team approach, I think, is very important. Yeah, definitely echo that. Um, definitely want to have multiple eyes on, on cancer for sure. Um, thank you for explaining that. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, this one is uh, on pulmonary fibrosis. Mm -hmm. How likely will pulmonary fibrosis uh, turn to lung cancer? So we know that, you know, pulmonary fibrosis has the same kind of risk factor, smoking, uh, chronic um, uh, older age, um, immunocompromised state. And so all those things can increase the lung cancers. So is that, will that cause lung cancers all the time? No, but there is an, and when you compare it to general population, there is a higher risk. Absolutely, yeah. Um, that makes sense, um, you know, thinking about it like that. Um, another question, um, this one's about um, VAT or VAT. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I had a lower left lobe, lobe um, VAT or um, video assisted thoracoscopic uh, surgery. Um, mm -hmm. My mother and brother had open lung surgery. My best friend had uh, robotic surgery. What is the difference between robotic and VAT? And what determines which one is chosen between the two for early stage? So VATS and robotic, they're both a type of minimum invasive procedures. Um, there are very good VATS surgeons or thoracoscopic surgeons who uses VATS and um, they get good outcomes. But not everyone does VATS the way that they do it. Um, technically, trying to get go around the structures, even if you have articulating instruments, it's very hard to get a good lymph node dissection. What I found in my practice is that using the robot, I'm able to do a better lymph node dissection. And so that's why I utilize the robot. But there are a um, few centers that are really good with VATS. So VATS and robot, as long as we're doing the same thing that we're getting the oncologic outcome that we want, then we could utilize. Uh, and it depends on the experience of the surgeon. Absolutely, yes, definitely makes sense there. Um, and then to be on top of time, um, I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next question. What is the rate of relapse uh, from the considered uh, surgical cure, quote unquote? Mm -hmm. So, you know, surgical cure is really important too kind of get the staging. Even after surgery, you look at more in lymph nodes. Look at, and so we know that stage 1A1, there's 90% um, you know, overall survival. So there's always a 10%. And that it's not, you know, it can come back within the next five years or people will not survive because there's recurrence. So 
you know, as high as 30, 40% of those patients can have recurrence later down the line. We don't know what the surgical cure is. Um, you know, lung cancer, the cancer cells may show up three years, two years down the line. It may show up in the staple line, even though, you know, you got an adequate margin. It may be in the lymph nodes in the other um, part of the lung that just traveled and you did an anatomic resection, and you, um, that can happen. And, um, you know, like for breast cancer, for example, those patients, they may end up with the breast cancer recurrence 10, 12 years down the line. And so we're finding more about as the treatment for lung cancer is improving, we'll have more patients who survive longer. And as we see that, we'll see, uh, better find out how those patients are going to do, what the true recurrence rate is. So it is very important that you follow your, um, you know, uh, surveillance schedule um, or any issues that you know, go see your doctor or your oncologist uh, to make sure that um, you're being followed. Definitely, yes. Um, hoping for better and better advancements in, mm -hmm. in treatment options there as well. Um, and one more question here is, um, will an older thoracic surgeon be up to date on how to do minimally invasive surgery? Are surgeons required to be up to date on your procedures? So, so uh, older surgeons, there are good older surgeons who have adapted robotics or VATS, and they're actually very good at it. Um, but it all depends on the, as you, the more cases you do, the better you get. Um, and so it's important to know that, hey, I mean, you know, surgery, like anything else, that we need to do it constantly, be able to be up to date. But we have continuing education. We have medical meetings, you know, surgical society meetings. And I mean, all these guidelines are being up to date. Um, so they should be, and they will be. Absolutely. Trust all of our uh, medical professionals to take care of us um, and to do what they need to do to stay up to date. But, but of um, course, the important thing about that um, is that if you have any questions, if you're not getting the answers, get us a kid's opinion. Talk to someone else. Um, if a patient of mine comes to me and says, hey, I want to talk to someone else. I have no problem with that because I want the patients to be feel like they understand their disease and be able to understand that, hey, these are my options. And the information that I give is not satisfying. Someone else may be able to. But the important thing is that patients have to understand it's all about the patients. It's not about us. It's not about our ego or techniques or whatnot. It's we want the best thing for the patient. And so most of us don't mind <laughs> um, second opinions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a couple of questions came in through the chat for live mm -hmm. participants. Um, here's one from Terry. Um, they say, thank you. Very informative. What benefit may lobectomy and uh, pleurectomy potentially have? Uh, offer for young healthy patients with oligometastatic lung cancer. I realize this uh, this is not minimally minimally invasive. And then they add uh, currently on TKI. Okay. So what we know is that once these cancers, the TKIs, or any type of new, you know, systemic therapies, targeted therapies, cancer cells are smarter than you know what we give credit for because they mutate and they it may stop working and so what we say for to me what i do for oligometastatic disease is is that if they're off therapy the longer you go without therapy and having no other disease that would be the best outcome of course if they're having um, complications having that lesion or the metastatic lesion and causing problems like recurrent infections or whatnot, and it's necrosed and it became an abscess and causing, then I may go in and be able to go in and take it out. Uh, but it's all individual, um, in, you know, basis. And it is something that has to be talked about during multidisciplinary um, to make sure that we're crossing our uh, T's and dotting our I's before we offer those. Because there are multiple complications that can happen from any surgery, especially if you are in treatment. Any type of systemic therapy, radiation, whatnot, can cause a lot of scarring and fibrosis. 
Wonderful. And just to stay on top of time, one last question. Uh, if my uncle is stable mm -hmm. with oral drug, should I get it removed and not yeah. continue with meds? The, term, uh, the tumor mass is uh, three centimeters. Yeah. So again, it all depends on, but you know, being on oral meds, most likely there is a other um, disease somewhere else, unless it's not a surgical candidate. But of course, hard to tell unless um, you know I have all the information. Um, but if it's on oral meds and stable, I will continue until it starts to progress and there's nothing else. Then it may be, if you need more tissue, for example, and can't get a biopsy, maybe it can be resected. But again, it has to be individualized. Absolutely, yes. Um, each case will be different. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so with that, um, we have a few closing remarks. Um, we'd like everyone to visit the lung.org website uh, where you can find valuable resources on lung cancer for you or your loved one. We offer the lung helpline. You can dial 1-800-LUNG-USA to connect. Um, we have a mentorship program and online support communities on our website. Um, and our next patient meetup will be on lung cancer biomarker testing with Dr. Mark A. Sosinski from Advent Health. That'll be next Wednesday, November 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And as part of this webinar, we ask participants to fill out a brief evaluation survey to help us continue to improve our meetup on the GO series. Um, this information will be sent out in an email, so keep an eye out. Um, thanks everyone for joining. And thank you, Dr. Bake, for a wonderful presentation and discussion. Um, hope to stay in touch. And if, you, if anyone ever needs anything, do reach out. Um, take care, everyone. Yeah, thank you.